Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Savvy Entrepreneur. Today we'll be joined by Rich Molloy, a good friend of mine, who is a venture partner at Springtime Ventures, as well as the VP of Engagement at Establish. Rich, how are you doing today? Charles, good to see you. Thanks for having me today. I appreciate it. I appreciate you joining us. So, yeah. Rich, tell me a little bit more about how you got involved with entrepreneurship. Sure. I, you know, I've been an entrepreneur all my life. I mean, ever since doing baseball card shows back when I was a, a, a kid. And I remember my first business card when I was around 16. Um, probably, yeah, probably around 16 is when I had my very first business card and tried making a, a business aside from mowing lawns and delivering newspapers and trying all sorts of other stuff. But, you know, my dad has worked for himself since I was three. And so I just grew up, you, you know, with in that, in that vibe of, you know, being around an, an entrepreneur. And so it's just always been part of, of my life. Uh, and in between jobs and changing careers, I've always been able to fall back on just doing some consulting work, just go out and find some clients and do some work and they turn into longer jobs. So I always tell people that my first career was in, in finance and I was in corporate finance. Uh, I specialized in analytics and reporting. And my second career was in sales. I actually did, did tech staffing sales. And both of those careers were in New York City. And so I was in Midtown Manhattan for 14 years. Um, and I always wanted to get into the tech startup world. And I, I dabbled a little bit in, in New York. I did a, one sales job at a, at, an, at, a, um, uh, at a tech startup in New York. Uh, but I really wanted to dive in deep on the, the the tech startup industry, and I didn't want to do it in New York. After 14 years, I was burnt out. I was ready to head to the mountains, uh, so I moved out to beautiful Boulder, Colorado, um, sight unseen actually. But I'd heard about this thing called Tech Stars, and I'd read about some other things happening in Boulder. And this was in 2011, and I filled uh, you know many roles in the the startup community. In, uh, in the front range, I've been everything from a enthusiastic attendee to, a, to an organizer, to an early employee, to a founder, uh, to a sponsor. Um, and I did a lot of work for a while as a, the uh, startup, running the startup programs for SoftLayer and then for IBM. Uh, and now I am both a uh, help big organizations find and engage with startups through established and I get to invest in startups through Springtime Ventures. So how is your time at SoftLayer different than your time now at Springtime? You know, I used to joke around that at Springtime uh, that it was like playing VC. It was like playing venture capitalist, um, except that instead of giving startups money, I was giving them credits to use SoftLayer servers. And the, the only, and it was, there's nothing like that, <laughs> but, but, um, but the only reason that I, I would make that analogy is that we were looking at SoftLayer. SoftLayer ended up being acquired by IBM and became the IBM cloud. But what SoftLayer specialized in was hybrid cloud solutions. And so you could have bare metal servers and with a, with a cloud interface as well. And so it, there was a very specific niche of startup that we were going after. And so I was out looking for startups. And so it was all about deal flow. And it was all about getting access to the best startups, getting access to them early, understanding what it is that they were doing and seeing if they were a fit for our program. And then if they were, inviting them to be a part of the program. Right? And for a for a venture firm, there's a lot of a lot of nuance around venture, right? But one of the most important things is that you have to have access to great companies and you have to have access to that deal flow. And it has to be so the startups and the deal flow that makes sense for you and for your fund and for your thesis. And so while giving away free software, you know, free, free server credits is nothing like venture investing. <laughs> um, it was a nice segue because I was able to, to you know, when, when my partner, Matt, was coming up with the idea, when he came up with the idea and was out trying to make springtime a thing, and we were out trying to raise money from LPs, um, it was I was able to bring this national perspective and this this broader deal flow perspective of oh I've seen that idea a dozen times and we see this a lot now that's really interesting and unique and I could also put some systems in place and and help organize efforts but I was able to bring that deal flow perspective to the table. 
Rich, you hit a lot of uh, really good points in that. Uh, do you want to give a more of a higher level understanding to our audience of what venture capital is and how you guys interact with business and how business and the community interact with you? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think the one of the, the important place to start when understanding venture capital is to understand how a venture capitalist makes money. And the first thing is to realize that the first, in order to found a venture capital firm, you have to go out and get money from other people. And so, you know, as we were raising the fund, fund one for springtime, um, we were in the same position as the startups that were pitching us. So as a startup, would, we, would, we would take a meeting with a startup that was pitching us. And then the very next meeting, we would be pitching a potential LP, right? LP stands for limited partner. And what the LPs do is they invest their money into the venture fund. And then what the venture fund does is it collects all of that limited partner money and they don't get a say in what you invest in, right? They're limited. That's the limited part of it. And so instead, they have to trust you and trust your thesis and trust your team that you're going to make the right investment decisions. And then you go out as a venture firm and you take that LP money and that now becomes your fund money and you go and invest that into startups. And you may have heard of um, uh, the two and 20 model. Right. And so what that refers to is, is the two is a 2% management fee and the 20 is a 20% carry. Um, and so the management fee is the, the 2% management fee means that, that the, the partners of the general firm, the general partners of the, of the firm take 2% per year from the total fund and use that to manage the operations, pay the salaries, pay the travel expenses, pay for the software, computers, you know, meetings, whatever the case may be. But the 20 piece refers to how much the VCs, the, the, the general partners of the venture firm keep after they pay back their investors, right? So let's say we have a $10 million fund and we have our first exit and we get, and let's say we get a million dollars back on that exit, which is you know, for, for a small fund is okay, right? Um, the GPs get nothing out of that, uh, out of that $1 million, right? Because we still have to pay back all of the LPs $10 million. And then after we pay back that $10 million to the LPs, then everything forward, the GPs get 20% and they give 80% back to the LPs. So the LPs, for them, this is an opportunity to make their money back and then make more and more of it. And the GPs are incentivized to make money on the on that 20%. And so everything over $10 million, the GPs are only making 20% on that. So that's that's the structure. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm glad that you are discussing this because so many people come to me and ask me about venture capital. One thing that many people don't realize is that VCs are very different. You mentioned your thesis. Do you want to go over your uh, particular thesis at Springtime and how that can differ from other VCs? Yeah, absolutely. So the, you know, uh, as I said before, you have to convince LPs to invest in, in you as a venture fund. And the way that you do that is you convince them that you have, um, you have a great team, that you're going to make great decisions, but also you need to, in, and also access to, to proprietary, proprietary deal flow is, is the VC speak equivalent to startup saying proprietary machine learning algorithms, right? Everybody says that they've got uh, <laughs> proprietary machine learning algorithms and every VC says they've got proprietary deal flow. I think I even said that to you when I was pitching Posifit that we had proprietary <laughs> ML algorithms. <laughs> <laughs> it's so it's so buzzy that it that it's lost all it's lost all meaning. Um, yeah. And uh, there's you know you know is is your machine learning really machine learning or is it just complicated if then statements right? And um, then you can say the same to to VCs right? Is your deal flow really proprietary or do you just you know have a big network like everybody else does? But one of the other pieces that you use to convince um, your LPs that you're a good investment for them is your thesis and to say, we are only investing in certain things. And we're only investing in these things because these are areas that we understand, or this is our strong belief in why this is why this works. So it's just like, you know, Warren Buffett has his perspective on the market on the, the public stock market. And this is no different than Warren Buffett has a perspective and 
Springtime Ventures has a perspective. I mean, you know, one could argue that Warren Buffett is better um, <laughs> at investing, right? But, you know, Springtime is still young, we'll see. But, um, but the perspective is that thesis, right? And so I'll share with you, for example, um, the Springtime thesis. So what, we, what we're looking for, I think about it as three pieces of the puzzle. And so the first is founders with deep domain expertise. So we want founders that have lived and breathed these problems and they know where uh, they've got, they've got the inside track connections inside of the industry because they've been in this industry for long enough, but they also know where the, where the traps are and where the pitfalls are. So they can jump over those pitfalls and they can, they can go around them and they can have the right connections. And so they're, they're set up for success. We believe they're set up for success with that when they have that deep domain expertise. Um, the next piece that we're looking for is truly transformative technology. And then the third piece is in a core industry in America. And those are, and those are integrally, in, in, those are tightly integrated. Um, they are integral to each other. Because first, it has to be a big enough market, right? And so this is another way that, to think about how venture capitalists are thinking about investments. So if we put a pause on the springtime theory, right, let's talk, let's, let's generalize again to VCs. Um, you know, uh, for a VC to make money, we have to return the whole fund. We have to pay back our investors everything. And we can only do that when we own a small part of a company. So if we only own small pieces of lots of companies, we need one company or, or two companies to give us that entire return. Right? And so if you don't, as a startup, don't have that huge exit opportunity, and by huge, I don't mean um, 50 million, I don't mean 100 million, I mean hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of exit opportunity. I mean, the world is obsessed with unicorns, whatever, you know, but for a small fund like us, a hundred, you know, a return in the hundreds of millions would, would be a fund returner, right? So let's back that, let's put that back on the springtime. We're, we believe that one of the things that leads to a fund return opportunity is being in a big market. And so there's tons of potential customers that you could go after, right? Enterprise is a great example of that, right? And so if you're going after the automotive industry, you maybe have only two dozen, you know, brands worldwide, but they are, but they're trillion dollar industries. So those are big industries. But then the tech, and this is the last piece, right? Is that tech has to be really, truly transformative. And it has to be something that is Going beyond just replacing spreadsheets, right? That you are, you could be replacing whole headcounts. You could be, you could be enabling entire businesses. You could be creating new lines of business, creating new opportunities within within companies. And so, something that just didn't exist before, and now all of a sudden, there's there are examples there of that. So, I'll give you a, a, a quick example that ties all those pieces together for us. Um, uh, was uh, it's a company called True Coach, and True Coach, we. Um, just recently sold. And so we had our first exit. It was a very quick exit, um, but we invested in True Coach in 2018. What they did was, or what they do is that they enable uh, professional trainers, uh, physical trainers to, excuse me, they, they, they enable physical trainers to remotely manage their clients. And so there's no way for, if you're, if you're a physical trainer, there's no way for you to scale yourself. Right. You've got to go show up at the gym with your client. You got to get on the phone with them. You got to coordinate. You got to schedule, blah, blah, blah. Nothing, in, nothing was out there for a, for a physical trainer to be able to engage with their clients at scale uh, until True Coach came around. And so True Coach was founded by a husband, uh, by, sorry, not a husband and wife team, um, the a husband and wife that had previously owned a gym. They, they had owned a, a, a CrossFit gym uh, and a weight building gym. And uh, Casey founded it. Um, and he was a gym owner, right? So he felt that pain and he was a physical trainer and he was trying to scale his himself to train multiple people all over the country, all over the world. Right. And so he built true coach in order to solve that problem. Um, and then it was a core industry in America, physical fitness. And, uh, you know, in, well, while the physical trainers are not necessarily core, the, the health and wellness industry is absolutely core. And there's a lot of private equity activity in that space. Um, and then the last piece was it was you know it was truly transformative, and so that you know True Coach had a had a um, uh, had a very short 
uh, quick exit, um, but that was a testament to the success of Casey Jenks and Robbie, um, you know, Robbie Jack uh, at, at building that up. Congratulations on the exit. I know that's a big deal. So that's awesome. Congrats. Yep. Didn't return the fund yet. So, you know, we still got to get up to that. <laughs> baby, baby steps, right? Baby steps. <laughs> exactly. So in addition to having good, uh, those three things that you alluded to, um, there's also timing. Companies are in different stages. Uh, is there a particular stage that you guys look for? And can you talk about how the stage kind of determines A, the check amount, and B, the type of VC that you're going to be looking for? Yep, absolutely. So we'll generalize that first, right, and talk about the, the stages. And the general, you know, going back um, maybe a dozen years ago, there was really venture capital started at series A and then went out from there. So you hear series A, B, C, D, right? Um, series A used to be the first institutional funding round, right? So before friends and family and, and, and everything, before everything else, it was, if you were raising money from venture capitalists, there were series A venture capitalists. But what has happened over the last few, last 10, 12 years is that, that there's a stage that happens before the the series a stage and that's the seed stage and that also used to just be one stage right it was just the seed stage and what the seed stage was it was um it was a time when the startup was still searching for that scalable repeatable business model two key elements there to a startup right scalable and repeatable and and so in the seed stage you're still funding a company before it it has both of those pieces before it's scalable and repeatable. They're searching for that, that right business model. They're searching for that product market fit. And so you're, you're, you're feeding dollars into that organization so that they can find that product market fit. And then they can go on to raise their series A and B and C and D and so on and so forth. And so, um, so that, and now the seed stage has turned into a seed phase where there's multiple seed phases, right? There's even pre-seed, which is the angels and the the friends, family, and fools round, right? And then there's institutional capital and accelerators come in at that first seed where maybe maybe a typical um, early seed round is typically what we see outside of the Bay Area. Like we're just going to take San Francisco and New York and we're going to leave them in their own little worlds, which is where they are. And that's fine. (laughs) Um, But the rest of the world, um, you know, a seed, a typical seed round is say a $4 million pre-money valuation, maybe a four to $6 million pre-money valuation. And you're raising anywhere from a million to to $2 million on that valuation, right? And the valuation is just a, it's kind of a made up number. It's kind of a, it's kind of a, we all agree that this is kind of what we think the company is worth right now. There's no art or sorry, there's no science to it. Little science, mostly art. Um, and so in that, so, so in that early, so you have that early seed, right? And then you have the later seed and the later seed is anywhere from that six to I've seen seed valuations up to $10 million pre-money valuations, raising 2 million on a 10 million pre, for example. And so those are, uh, that's the, that's the, the phase. And that could take you, it could be one year that you're raising money in, in seed valuations, or it could be three years that you're raising money in seed valuations. And so springtime, we've invested across the full spectrum of, of the seed phase. We've invested at the, the absolute earliest, earliest stages. And we've invested at the absolute last, last money in last seed round before the series a opened up the next you know in in six months or whatever so we've invested across all of those we typically write about 130k uh check size is our is our average check size we also reserve a big portion of our fund 40 percent of our fund is reserved for follow-on investments and so that means when you go to raise your series a we're going we want to evaluate it and decide if we want to follow on if we want to make an additional investment which is always a good indicator for your your next investors if your previous investors are following on. And plus that allows you to avoid dilution. Yes, absolutely, right? And so we we being the investors, we can maintain our ownership percentage as we continue to follow on, right? Absolutely, right? Because if our ownership percentage shrinks with each round, then we need a larger and larger exit in order for us to make money. 
in order for our LPs to make money. And so if we're able to maintain that ownership, reduce our, you know, keep our dilution down, but if we're able to maintain our, uh, the way I would think about it would be to maintain, to keep our ownership percentage, uh, keep our pro rata as it's called, um, and, you know, continue that in the later rounds until that exit comes. Given everything that's going on with COVID, what is the current state of venture capital? Yeah, man, it's such an interesting time right now. And um, I think there's a, there's a few things at work here. Um, there are some very, very clear losers in this game. Uh, travel, events, um, you know, anything, <laughs> anything in person, um, private equity firms that were previously gobbling up. Um, we were just talking about this uh, health and wellness, you know, you know gym related businesses and, and um, uh, you know, yoga studio and supporting fitness, anything supporting anything remote is booming. You know, there was a, a tele, a telehealth telemedicine company that was, um, uh, it was for vets that we looked at and we didn't, and we did not end up investing in, but boy, oh boy, they just have investors beating down their door, trying to invest in them right now. Excuse me. So you have some very clear, losers in this space right now and you have some very clear winners but yet that winner piece still is undecided right what's happening is is that these industries that are getting all getting all this attention um you know zoom is getting tons of attention right now right but you know telemedicine is getting a ton of attention and remote um education and uh nursing so for established for example we just did, invested in a company called kamana health and what kamana health does is it enables nurses to share their information for, or tr specifically traveling nurses, to share their information more easily, make it more accessible, and have them find the right jobs more, uh, you know, um, find the right fits for them in job placements. And they're, they're, they um, had 50% growth in their number of registered nurses on their platform in one month. And, you know, so, but yet, so, but yet we still don't know who the winners are because we still don't know what's happening. We don't know what's coming up in the next three to six months. And so the challenge, the onus falls on the startup for them to acquire those customers as quickly as they can and then hold on to them and ensure that they do have the right products so that they can maintain those customers. And so the state right now is they're still, you know, we were reaching a period Coming into, into 2019, or sorry, 2019, we had seen some of the, the largest amount of seed stage investment that we had seen in a long time. And coming into 2020, there was still a lot of what's called dry powder, right? There was still a lot of, of capital that venture firms still had yet to deploy. And now what we're seeing is, is that venture firms are actually raising the bar for where they're going to make their investments, unless they're in, in that hot category, right? If they're in that hot tele anything category, then, then that's one thing. Everything else, we've seen Series A deals fall apart at the, at the term sheet level because of everything happening. And they said, well, we used to take companies that had you know, annual revenues here, but now we're going to raise the bar to here. And, and everything else is a wait and see. And so that's just going to be a, there's going to be a squeeze at that Series A right now, because there's still a lot of seed money in out there that can be put out. And so the Series A investors can afford to wait a little bit longer. You mentioned that you're also involved with Established. Can you describe that entity and what you do there? Absolutely. So Established is a consulting firm, and we help big organizations find and engage with startups. So what we do is ecosystem development, if you will, at large. Um, some of our clients include the NASA iTech program, AFWorks, the innovation arm of the Air Force, uh, Silicon Valley Bank, and American Airlines are uh, other corporate clients as well. So what we're, what we're out there doing is finding the right startups for these organizations to engage with. And we have a program called Startup of the Year, and it's great to be a part of both springtime and established because, you know, as a venture capitalist, you say no way more than you say yes. Um, and our uh, a great phrase that I love is our partner at Springtime, Rick Patch, uh, he says, no is the second best answer. 
Um, and, you know, and so you're, you know, you're laughing, right? Because the slow no is the worst. And this is a VC thing is, is that you just, you drag out saying no and you never hear back from them and they ghost you. And so no is the second best answer. And so now at, at springtime, when we say no, or even before we say yes or no to a company, I could say, I have all these other resources for you through startup of the year. And Startup of the Year is a global startup network and competition. And we find all these great startups and then we present them with opportunities. Like, for example, we have a, uh, a special award for veteran founded startups. And so if you're a veteran watching this and you have a startup, we have a $10,000 uh, cash prize for the veteran, the .us veteran startup of the year award. And that's brought to you by the people that own the .us domain. Because they want that .us to really resonate as, as this is a this is a US company, this is a this is a company focused on on growing the American economy. And so um, and I'll and I'll add one other thing here about Athworks because Athworks is a great program that has that is a fast contracting method to get the Air Force as a client. So you can get a yes or no from the Air Force within 60 days of applying. And it's a phased program. They use SBIR dollars, which is a small business industry research program. And um, you can get a $50,000 contract um, for three months, and they will pay you to do customer discovery to find a paying customer in the Air Force. And then that takes you to a phase two. And the phase two can be anywhere up to $750,000 or up to uh, $1.5 million. Excuse me, I think right now it's only up to $1 million. Um, but this is a great way to have the Air Force as a customer. And they're looking for, they're looking for, businesses that you may not typically think of as working with the DOD, right? So it's not like, you know, uh, uh, source programmable guidance or, you know, missile, you know, systems or something like that, right? It's um, a great example is a company out of Austin, Texas called CareStarter. And CareStarter just helps families find the right resources that they need locally when they move to a new city. And this is a common problem with any military is you get moved to a different base and Where's the best daycare and where are the summer programs and what are the schools like and all this. And so this is something you wouldn't think of as being a DOD, um, having the DOD as a client, but it's a great fit for what's going on. In fact, True Coach has actually um, had a phase two with the Air Force because they were enabling airmen that failed their physical to get remote coaching support from the, the, the people at the Air Force Research Laboratory that managed the physical training program. So a lot of opportunities exist out there for startups, you know, and, and my job at both established and springtime is to connect startups with the resources they need to succeed. Great, Rich. So if a company was interested or is interested in applying to the established uh, startup of the year program, what would you recommend they do and what kind of traction are you expecting your applicants to have? Yeah. Absolutely. So we at Startup of the Year, we're looking for startups that have um, that are beyond the idea phase. So you have to have at least a working prototype or a working um, online product all the way up to no more than five million in funding and total funding or in less than six years old. So we're in that firmly in that seed phase for Startup of the Year. And the, you just go to startupofyear.com and there is an application on there and you fill out the application and we'll get you piped into the network right away. Great. And for springtime ventures, you know, we're looking for, as I mentioned before, founders with deep domain expertise, truly transformative technology in core industries. And if you think you may be a fit, um, then you can go to springtimeventures.com and apply there to, uh, to learn more about us. Great, Rich. I really appreciate the time today. For everyone else out there, if you are interested in applying to start the year, uh, please click on the link below, and we'll see you next time. Stay savvy.